Okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we will uh, start uh, the meet uh, the, the conference in thirteen uh, hundred Indonesian time. Uh, but now uh, we will um, uh, watch together the profiles of the hosts for today, uh, which are um, government science. Uh, Universitas Diponegoro and also a Center for Media and Democracy (LPDIS). Um, now we would like to uh, first see the profile of uh, the Diponegoro University uh, Government Science. Um, uh, screen is yours, Pak Gulam. Thank you. Um, now, um, LBTKS will also share the uh, video uh, for Mas Iqbal. The screen is yours. Mas Iqbal, there's no sound in the video, yeah?
So this is the situation of um, um, our office today, and there are some events there um, that we held um, recently, like uh, School of Democracy. Yeah. Um, this year we will celebrate our uh, 50 years per day. Yeah? This is the research school. And this was the event from uh, last year. And this is the last year as well, before the pandemic came. And then the lucky day was still with us, yeah, back then. With respect to uh, February uh, 2020. So before the pandemic hit us. Yes, uh, no sound. It makes it uh, more dramatic. Yeah, it's like you know we we're watching a movie, but in a in a flashback. Pak Gulam, uh, why is there no sound as well here? Yeah, okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, Pak Gulam. We're still uh, waiting for the participants, uh, other participants as well as the presenters for the fun panel 4A, as well as the chair um, for the panel, who is uh, Professor Michelle Ford. Still have uh, 12 minutes from now. And I would like to, um, yes, I'll see here. Is it uh, Gabriel Fakal or truly? <clears throat> hello. Hello. Yes, hello. Uh, but we cannot see you. I think it's uh, Gabriel. 
Hello, it's Gabriel. Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, but we cannot see you, Gabriel. I just uh, wake up. I just wake up here. It's, uh, it's oh, yeah, it's still morning. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. We okay. have two children, so. Yes, like, yes. Oh, yeah. Nice. Nice. Yeah, yeah. I, How I, are I you know. with Jack? Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. Yes. Um, the, the, the discussion was wonderful, yeah, last night, yeah. Uh, with uh, Tania Lee. Yeah. yeah. I really enjoyed it, but uh, I couldn't participate because the reason was also that the child, the child, my daughter, yeah. it was a bad time. So, you know, bad mm -hmm. time, yeah. I mean, yeah. Bad, yeah, not, not bad time, but it can be the same as well. <laughs> Imagine. Okay. Yeah, time for sleep and yeah, still working. Okay, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, in, the, in the second day of the um, Altrosi conference, uh, today uh, it is hosted by, uh, together by LPDIS, Center for Media and Democracy LPDIS, and uh, Department of Government Science, uh, Diponegoro University. Uh, the, the, the panel will start in uh, 10 minutes. And I would like to use uh, this opportunity to welcome you all from wherever you are. And also would like to uh, inform you to some of our event, of uh, our upcoming event. And here, here it is, the event. Uh, so as you could see there, um, there are two upcoming events uh, which, which was held together. Uh, um, first, uh, it will be held together between uh, LPDKS and also the Ponegoro University, which is uh, Sekolah Demokrasi. This is a um, uh, democracy school. Um, um, uh, we, in this uh, school, we bring together all, all of the uh, elements of uh, uh, Indonesian uh, society, uh, which we consider have an important role to support democracy, uh, such as uh, academics, journalists, um, um, politicians, um, state apparatus, yeah, um, uh, activists, civil society activists, uh, religious leaders uh, to participate in our school, and uh, these are the speakers. Uh, and then it will be held uh, from 12 to 19 August 2020. So the end will be in 19 August, in which uh, we also have our um, our birthday, our first 50 uh, birthday, ulang tahun yang ke 50. And the the next event uh, will be held together uh, between the uh, Ponorogo University and LPDKS, and as well as uh, um, Kase, yeah, uh, Altersi, uh, Gabriel, and Julie uh, are also here, also Sarah, um, and uh, Ceseas uh, Kyoto, um, Masaki Okamoto uh, will be here, and SafeNet Indonesia. So uh, this summer course uh, is intended to, uh, to discuss about social media activism, digital resilience, and resistance to democratic creation. So, uh, we bring together scholars from Southeast Asia uh, to come and join with us to reflect about uh, the current state of our uh, digital democracy in Southeast Asia. Uh, it will uh, start in 22 August until uh, for September 2020. So please uh, feel free uh, to join. Uh, the contact person is here, uh, Pa Zunuanus Kulamanar. Um, and, um, we are welcome. Uh, we will welcome uh, any any participants from uh, uh, different backgrounds, be it from Indonesia and also abroad. There would be uh, some informations uh, regarding uh, Undip and LPDIS. Um, we'll we will still have uh, seven minutes before we uh, start. Pak Gulam, uh, is there any additional information that you would like to share with us? Hi, Michelle. Welcome. Hi. Hi. Yes. Um, so, how are you? Very well, thank you. 
Yeah. Um, it's great to see so many people in the room. So we're starting in six minutes, is that correct? That's right, six minutes. And we already start uh, 24 minutes ago, but that's for the promotion for the institution. Yeah? Uh, mm -hmm. So um, I suppose you are in Australia right now, right? Yes, yeah. In Sydney, yeah? Yeah, that's correct. Sydney. So, it's not, so it's not too early like uh, Gabriel in, in France. He said he just <laughs> start, uh, started his day. Yeah, no, finishing our day. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, so, Michelle, I would like to uh, explain some uh, or to make sure about some some uh, things yeah, for, for how we run out the program because uh, yesterday uh, I was the chair and also the host as well uh, from the Bonogoro University and I play the video of every presenters. Uh, would you uh, like to do the same or, or you will go straight to the question and answer because you are the chair, you have the freedom to, to proceed, yeah? Mm -hmm. No, I'm very happy to follow the instructions. So what we'll do for this panel is we'll watch the presentations, the videos of the presentations. I won't take up any time to present my views up front. I'd rather give maximum time for all our participants to ask questions. But I would ask that participants, um, do we, do they, the participants have access to the question and answer function? Yes, uh, the participants have the, the access for the for the room, yeah, uh, chat room. So okay. they, they are free to ask anything. Yeah, yeah so I, I won't be encouraging them to ask in person. I will be reading the chat and putting the questions to, to the people. Yep, great, great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, now, the oh, yeah, that's okay. Um, yeah, it's fine. I mean, I, I, it would be helpful if I could I get into the room on my laptop as well, or is that because I'm on the iPad for the video? But is there another link that I can use to just get in on through the laptop so I can see the chat on the other machine? Yeah. Yeah, that would be really good, I think. Uh, yeah, uh, so just, just to make it clear, so you would like uh, us to play the video, yeah? Yes. Of the participants, okay. Of the presenters, I mean. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, but to, can I get in as a second person? That's what I'm asking you. Oh. Doesn't uh, matter. I'll course. just deal with it. It's okay. Yeah. It's okay. Yeah. Yes, you will be the co-host, of course. Yes. Yes, you can. So, um, welcome to LPDIS and also the Bonogoro University that uh, hosting this um, panel together, yeah? Um, and we, we usually have a, a broad uh, audience uh, from different backgrounds and some journalists as well. Just want to make sure. Uh, uh, so our chair, uh, Professor Michelle Ford uh, is already with us. So I just want to make sure that the presenters are also here. Uh, Pradipa Rasidi, uh, Jim Donavi. Ah, yes. Uh, hello, hi there. Uh, that also familiar because um, sometimes my daughter also comes to my room. Not sometimes, quite often. <laughs> but I have, I always make sure that my wife is taking care of her. <laughs> sometimes I do the same for my wife, yeah, just to make sure. <laughs> That is not, you know. Ma uh, Herlambang Ratraman, Mas Herlambang, you are you here? Bisa dicoba screennya, Mas Her. Yeah, I'm, I'm still alive. Yeah. Good. <laughs> <laughs> That's important. And we also have uh, Mr. Muhammad Taufan Arifudin. Uh, his Facebook name I know is Taufan Malaka. Yeah. He was here yesterday. But I haven't seen him. Perhaps he will join us later. Elsita, <clears throat> um, would you uh, please to help us to present the video later? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Great. Yeah. So um, uh, Michelle uh, here with us. So there's Elsita uh, that will help me. Also, uh, Pagulam. Uh, he will uh, guide this uh, event together. Mm -hmm. 
we will have uh, two hours uh, ahead, yeah? It's, one um, and a half. This one's one and a half. Um, yes, remember, one and a half. The, yes, that's right. Sorry. Yeah, the panel, the other panel, 4B, is on straight after this. So we wanted to give people an opportunity to uh, attend both. Yes. So this one will yeah. be one and a half. Yes. But yeah. I won't give any discussion. So we'll have plenty of time for questions. Yep. Yep. Great. Uh, we will we will have uh, one and a half, and uh, the next uh, the next panel will be uh, using the same uh, the same uh, Zoom link. So, uh, if you wish to uh, to watch the the other panel in which the, there is me there, so um, please stay. I, I hope uh, the announcement that there's me uh, encourage you to stay, uh, not discourage you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, it's almost, yeah, it's just one minute, I guess. Uh, can I start now? Yep, uh, thank you. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, if you, um, good morning, everyone. Uh, for those who are in, in, in Europe, yeah? So I think I will say to my, my friend, uh, Gabriel Bonjour. I hope I pronounced it correctly. Uh, Selamat siang uh, untuk kawan-kawan di Indonesia. Uh, good afternoon, I think, yeah, for friends uh, in Australia. Uh, I hope um, you are safe and sound, healthy today, because that's very important in the uh, during this time of a uh, pandemic. Yeah, uh, we know it that it's coming. The second wave of of the pandemic uh, hits Indonesia, and uh, it's going on now. Uh, a lot of uh, friends are mourning and also uh, got sick. Yeah. Uh, let's uh, let's hope that this will be over soon. Uh, so uh, this is the second day of the Alto-C conference, and this is the uh, the panel 4A and 4B uh, later on on political participation. And uh, this panel is hosted by uh, Center for Media and Democracy (LPDAS) and also uh, Government Science Department, uh, Diponegoro University, uh, Indonesia. Um, we, we we already have with us uh, Professor Michel Ford. Uh, that will be uh, uh, who will uh, who will act as the chair for this uh, panel, and um, um, I am as well as uh, Gabriel yeah, and Michel are part of the scientific board. We have the privilege to uh, to read a lot of um, uh, very interesting uh, abstract. Yeah. But that will be the, the job of uh, uh, Michelle to uh, present it to you. I will not take her job. Uh, okay, uh, I just want to welcome you again. Welcome everyone. And please enjoy the fruitful discussion uh, from, for one and a half hours. Uh, Michelle, now the screen is yours. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here and congratulations on the Alter C team for organizing this great initiative. Um, in our panel today, we have four speakers. I'll briefly give you a sense of who they are, but then I'll let their videos speak for themselves. And as we mentioned, after that, we'll go straight into question and answer. Just in terms of housekeeping, as some of you may have heard before, we won't be taking live questions. We'd ask you to put your questions in the chat and then I will curate the questions for our speakers to make sure that the most interesting questions hopefully get asked, but also a range of questions. So please, as you're listening to the videos, start putting your questions in the chat um, to help us make the most of this session. So we've got four speakers today, uh, as has been previously mentioned. Uh, I'm going to talk about them in alphabetical order. So the first is Jim Donaghy, who's a punk working in academia, according to his biography, and his haircut attests to this, I guess. Um, Jim has been doing research with punks and anarchists, anarchists in Indonesia for about 10 years, as well as a range of other, in that range of other international contexts. His research into the intersections between music and politics includes an emphasis on participatory action research and creative methodologies. He combines his focus on punk and anarchism with an exploration of issues of cultural repression, close conflict legacies, contested spaces, and transnational movement organizing. Jim is a research fellow at the Center for Media Research at Ulster University in the north of Ireland. 
leading an AHRC early career funded project titled Fail States and Creative Resistances, The Everyday Life of Punks in Belfast, Banda Ache, I don't know how to say that, Mitrovica and Soweta. He is on the board of the Punk and Post Punk Journal and is a member of the Executive Editorial Board of Anarchist Studies Journal and is the web editor of anarchiststudies.blog and drums with the band Lawfucker. Okay, Jim is going to talk to us today on a paper titled Under the Radar, The Changing Face of Repression Against Anarchism and Punk in Indonesia. Our second speaker will be Pradeep Arasidi, who received his Master's in Anthropology from the University of Indonesia just last year. Congratulations, a real achievement during COVID, uh, with a thesis on Twitter micro-celebrities and virtual peacemaking. He completed his bachelor's in political science also at the University of Indonesia, and his research interests include digital policy, self, personhood, myths, and narrative. He previously worked as a developer and a designer in information te the information technology industry and was involved in digital media projects with multiple NGOs. He currently works as a research assistant in the Dutch Indonesian project on cyber troops and public opinion manipulation in Indonesia. And the paper to be presented today is titled Playing with Politics, Cyber Troops and Its Moral Theatre. A great title there. Our third speaker is Muhammad Taufan, who is a PhD student at, in the Department of International Cooperation Studies at Nagoya University in Japan. His major interests are media, politics and democracy, and his PhD research is on oligarchy and civil society in the sector of broadcast media, but also anti-corruption in contemporary Indonesia. And he's going to speak to us today about civil society and oligarchic power, a state case study of broadcast media reform in post saharo Indonesia. And our fourth, last but not least, speaker is Harlamang Widraman from Arlanga. He's a senior lecturer in constitutional law and in the Centre of Human Rights Law Studies. Uh, Arlanga's, Harlamang's PhD is in, uh, in law from the Van Wollenhoven Institute, Faculty of Law at Leiden, with a thesis entitled Press Freedom, Law and Politics in Indonesia, a Socio-Legal Study. And he's going to speak to us today about the return of authoritarian politics and its impact on academic freedom in Indonesia. And just before we, we um, continue, all the women who are in the audience, it would have been lovely to have one of you in our manual today. So I apologize for the manual, it was my, my doing, but hopefully um, we've got some great comp, uh, questions and from the um, women in the audience. Over to the videos, thanks. Else we cannot hear the, the sound. Um, is it okay? Not yet. Else, uh, let me try to do it from here. Sorry, everyone. Um, perhaps it's, uh, yeah. My name is Jim Donahue. Thanks to Gloria and Gabriel and everyone at Aldersea for inviting me to present today. And thanks to Astrid for chairing the panel. Thanks also to Pradeepa and Mohammed for presenting alongside me. I'll be talking today about anarchism in contemporary Indonesia, especially its connections with punk counterculture. I will speak about repression against punks and anarchists and the changing motivations that inform that repression and the response of punk and anarchist communities to this repressive context. I'll start with a quick uh, overview of the historical trajectory of anarchism in Indonesia.
before looking at the re-emergence of anarchism alongside punk in the very late 1980s, but mainly the 1990s. I will detail the forms of repression faced by punks and anarchists, and especially the religious dimension of that repression. I will then chart a partial shift in the authorities' understanding of anarchism and how that has altered the repressive context as a result. The main focus of this presentation is contemporary, but just to set some of the historical context, uh, it is well known that Marxism was the dominant ideology of the revolutionary left in Indonesia throughout the first half of the 20th century and into the 1960s, especially as manifested in the mass movement Partai Communis Indonesia, PKI. This was at one point the largest communist party in the world that hadn't yet seized power. However, anarchism was a significant strand from the inception of the movement opposing the Dutch colonial government. And even within the explicitly Marxist PKI, anarchism also had some influence. In 1926, for example, the party's newspaper, API, featured quotes from the anarchist political philosopher Bukunin on its front page. And this was such a strong influence that two years earlier in 1924, a leading PKI figure named Darsono insisted that PKI members should remember that the communism of Marx and not the anarchism of Bukunin must govern the party. According to Bima's 2018 book, Differences in political ideology within the Indonesian left were not actually a significant problem because they had a common enemy in the invaders of the Dutch East Indies. And according to Bima, anarchist ideas have in fact coloured Marxist and social democratic organisations throughout the 19th and 20th centuries. My own knowledge of this earlier anarchist movement in Indonesia is somewhat limited, I must admit. So I don't know whether it's the case that this anarchist current in the PKI was successfully suppressed by orthodox Marxists such as Darsono, or whether anarchist-minded activists were able to organize independently within specifically anarchist organizations and unions. But whatever the case, anarchism persisted to at least some extent within the political lexicon of Indonesia into the 1960s. And it is notable that the prominent student activist, So Hokji, described himself as an anarchist at that time in his correspondences with Benedict Anderson, though I am not aware of his direct involvement in any explicitly anarchist organisations. After 1965, that all changed, of course, the installation of the Suharto regime and the ensuing Red Scare and murder campaign practically destroyed any left-wing political current in Indonesia. I will stop uh, sharing screen um, because Elsitra already told me that She's now sure that it works with the full screen. Uh, please tell me if there is no sound again this time, all right? I will. Uh, it's because, um, Wijay, you, you played the video from our website, so right. um, you should okay. play it from directly from uh, YouTube. Hello, my name is. Ah, Jim great, <laughs> wonderful. Gloria and Gabriel great. and everyone at Altersea for inviting me to present today, and thanks to Astrid for chairing the panel. Thanks also to Pradeepa and Mohammed for presenting alongside me. I'll be talking today about anarchism in contemporary Indonesia, especially its connections with punk counterculture. I will speak about repression against punks and anarchists and the changing motivations that inform that repression and the response of punk and anarchist communities to this repressive context. I'll start with a quick uh, overview of the historical trajectory of anarchism in Indonesia before looking at the re-emergence of anarchism alongside punk in the very late 1980s, but mainly the 1990s. I will detail the forms of repression faced by punks and anarchists, and especially the religious dimension of that repression. I will then chart a partial shift in the authorities' understanding of anarchism and how that has altered the repressive context as a result. The main focus of this presentation is contemporary, but just to set some of the historical context, uh, it is well known that Marxism was the dominant ideology of the revolutionary left in Indonesia throughout the first half of the 20th century and into the 1960s, especially as manifested in the mass movement Partai Communist Indonesia, PKI. This was at one point the largest communist party in the world that hadn't yet seized power. However, anarchism was a significant strand from the inception of the movement opposing the Dutch colonial government. And even within the explicitly Marxist PKI, anarchism also had some influence. In 1926, for example, the party's newspaper, API, featured quotes from the anarchist political philosopher Bukunin on its front page. And this was such a strong influence that two years earlier in 1924, 
a leading PKI figure named Darsono insisted that PKI members should remember that the communism of Marx and not the anarchism of Bakunin must govern the party. According to Bima's 2018 book, differences in political ideology within the Indonesian left were not actually a significant problem because they had a common enemy in the invaders of the Dutch East Indies. And according to Bima, anarchist ideas have in fact coloured Marxist and social democratic organisations throughout the 19th and 20th centuries. My own knowledge of this earlier anarchist movement in Indonesia is somewhat limited, I must admit, so I don't know whether it's the case that this anarchist current in the PKI was successfully suppressed by orthodox Marxists such as Darsono, or whether anarchist-minded activists were able to organise independently within specifically anarchist organisations and unions. But whatever the case, anarchism persisted to at least some extent within the political lexicon of Indonesia into the 1960s. And it is notable that the prominent student activist So Hok Ji described himself as an anarchist at that time in his correspondences with Benedict Anderson, though I am not aware of his direct involvement in any explicitly anarchist organisations. After 1965, that all changed, of course, the installation of the Suharto regime and the ensuing Red Scare and murder campaign practically destroyed any left-wing political current in Indonesia. But significantly, the persisting legal repressions against the left targeted the PKI and Marxism, or Marxist-Leninism specifically. Anarchism itself was not legally prescribed and as such, for many years in the latter part of the 20th century and early 21st century, Anarchism was not recognised by the authorities as a leftist political current, but merely as a synonym for chaos, as, as I will explain. In some ways this hasn't changed, but the picture has, complicated, uh, has been complicated in recent years, uh, as I will discuss. So the re-emergence of anarchism then was uh, some 25 years later in the 1990s. Punk arrived in Indonesia in the very late 1980s primarily through punk individuals travelling from the Netherlands to Indonesia. For example, one person from the Dutch band Antidote was instrumental in sending punk records and anarchist literature to the nascent punk scene in Bandung. By 1996, amid the growing anti suharto movement, the first political punk scene in Indonesia was produced in Bandung, titled Submissive Riot, with others such as Contaminazi Propagandi appearing in subsequent years. You can see them in the images here. More widely, Sean Martin Iverson describes the Reformasi period as the high point for anarcho-punk in the Indonesian underground. Punks and anarchists who participated in the anti-Suharto movement framed their struggle as anti-fascist, fighting against the militarist, capitalist and totalitarian aspects of Suharto's regime. You can see some anti-fascist imagery from a punk record here to the right of your screen. Indeed, the collective responsible for producing the submissive riot zine developed into an organised group called Front Antifascis, or Antifascist Front, in 1997. The zine Militancy, on the top right, is by FAF, and you can see people holding the FAF banner with a punk aesthetic quite apparent there. Their activism included protests, cultural production, organising workers to take strike action at a local factory, and even taking over a government radio station to broadcast anti suharto messages. After the collapse of the Suharto regime in 1998, FAF joined with other anti-fascist groups across Indonesia to form Jaringan Antifascist Nusantara, or JAFNUS, the Archipelago Anti-Fascist Network. A later group called Jaringan Anti-Authoritarian, JAO, Anti-Authoritarian Network, was formed in 2007. The political activism of the punk movement arguably shifted to a focus on cultural production in the post-Reformasi years, but as Martin Iverson notes, Indonesian punks continued to participate in class-oriented political action from solidarity with striking workers to participating in May Day demonstrations and May Day protests have been very significant in recent years. The creation of a new anti-anarchy police division in March 2011 highlighted the state's fundamental misunderstanding or overlooking anarchy as a political current. Since this police, uh, this police division was created to quell religious mob-based attacks and rioting by groups such as from from Pambela Islam, and this had nothing to do with targeting anarchist political activists. Uh, rioting football fans in 2016 were also described as supporter anarchists in June 2016 by the new chief of police, Tito Carnavian, and we'll have more from him later. 
This misunderstanding of anarchism does not mean, however, that anarchists were free from repression during this period. And indeed, repression against anarchists has been most commonly experienced through the anarchist movement's association with punk, with punk being regularly repressed because of its perceived religious contraventions. To give just two examples uh, quite quickly, in December 2011, 64 punks were abducted at gunpoint by Sharia police in Banda Aceh and interned for 10 days at a boot camp for religious re-education. The mayor defended her actions to the international news media, inter insisting that the raid was necessary and would be repeated as punk constituted a new social disease. She said that punk was in conflict with the Islamic and cultural traditions of Aceh and Indonesia and hence, hence must be eliminated. This repression extends, uh, and the religious nature of it, extends beyond Aceh. Um, in 2016, the first Lady Fast feminist punk music festival was held in Yogyakarta. A group of men disrupted the festival, shouting Allahu Akbar, God is great, and accused the organisers of corrupting morals, dressing inappropriately and being communists. The police stopped the mob's attack and the festival, and then proceeded to detain the festival organisers, questioning them about the nature of their event and about a book on LGBT rights the police discovered at the venue. So the religious dimension is clear in both cases, uh, but so too is the continuing red scare in this case and the accusation of being communists. So it's apparent that political repression intertwines closely with the core religious repression of punk, and by extension anarchism, in Indonesia. But the key point uh, is that until this point, the authorities misunderstood punk and the anarchist movement that was closely associated with it because they were preoccupied with the outwardly visible contraventions of Islamic doctrine. They failed to grasp the connections of anti-statist and anti-capitalist politics. Clearly, this misapprehension did not protect anarchists and punks from, uh, from repression, but it likely altered the scope and form of that repression. The increasing influence of neoliberalism in Indonesia has been impactful, both on anarchist activism and on repressive policing. Despite the hopes for a restructuring of society, neoliberalism and neocolonialism have been accelerated in post-reformatic Indonesia, with privatisation and greater penetration by global corporations under the veil of democratisation, as George Katsiafikis puts it. The environmental and social damage caused by this rampant neoliberalism has been a motivation for resistance and activism by groups linked to the anarchist movement and by the anarchist-associated punk scene. You can see some anti-neoliberal and anti-corporate stickers, posters, zines and patches here from various Indonesian cities. The farm or die zine is part of the long-running campaign against the ruinous effects of corporate iron mining in the Kulon Progo area near Yogyakarta. The Unrest Collective produced this scene, detailing the struggle of the Paguyoban Patanai Lahan Pantai, PPLP, or Society of Coastal Land Farmers, to protect native farming methods and their community. And there have been various solidarity actions in other cities as well. The Forum Solidaritas Melawan Pangusuran, uh, Solidarity Forum uh, Resisting Eviction in Tamansari, Bandung, in 2018, highlighted exactly this neoliberal motivation behind the ongoing land grab by the city government there, as well as identifying it as an extension of Suharto-era corruption. The anarchist influence on the resistance campaign is clear in the imagery here, uh, with punk music also playing a key role in the cultural aspects of the protest. In these cases, neoliberal development projects are being resisted, and the police and other state forces are recognised as the enforcers of this neoliberal agenda. The involvement of the anarchist movement at the forefront of this anti-neoliberal struggle and their direct confrontation against the police as agents of this neoliberal authoritarian regime has led to a step change in the Indonesian state's understanding of anarchism. Having been overlooked and misunderstood for decades, anarchist-informed activism is now on the police radar, with anarcho-syndicalism specifically being denounced by Tito Karnavian in the media as a new ideological spectre alongside communism and Islamic extremism. Mm. He called it a foreign doctrine and an international phenomenon and ordered police personnel to map out the group's members. May Day 2019 saw significant protest actions in Surabaya, Makassar, Yogyakarta, Malang, Jakarta and in Bandung. As evidence of the repression now faced by anarchists during that May Day event in Bandung, police arrested 619 
of the estimated 1,000 protesters for vandalism and destruction of public property, who were then beaten, stripped and bullied. They had their heads shaven and were subjected to re-education. This response is strongly reminiscent of the repression of the HA64 in 2011. You can see that in the images here. Arrests of alleged anarcho-syndicalists were also made at this time in West Java, East Java and South Sulawesi and the media uh, portrayed the anarcho-syndicalists as masterminding the protests and property damage and infiltrating the May Day March. This is not to say that anarchism is now well understood by the powers that be, nor by scholars. Indeed, an academic named Andreas Wimmer in 2014 made the absurd characterization of contemporary anarchists in Indonesia as part of the growing Marxist-Jihadist collaboration. The conflation with Marxism is at least interesting, considering the historical closeness in the Indonesian context, but the suggestion that anarchism is connected to jihadism is ludicrous, and this parroting of the warped state narrative on this issue is evidence of deeply uncritical scholarship on Wimmer's part. And despite Karnavian's identification of anarcho-syndicalism as a new spectre, he returned to using the term anarchist more indiscriminately in September 19 to announce an edict to repress protests in Papua if they have the potential to be anarchic, better potency anarchists. So the confused misapplication of anarchism by the state uh, actually persists even after the high profile May Day 2019 events. But despite this continued uh, confusion from the state, to some degree, the rhetoric has changed in recent years and anarchist activists, at least when they're named as anarcho-syndicalists, are now explicitly repressed on political grounds. As a result, it may be argued that strategies of evasion are more necessary for punks and anarchists now. This is not a new strategy. Punks and anarchists have long faced harassment and religiously motivated repression, and groups have established countercultural hubs on the outskirts of cities as a means to escape this day-to-day -day interference and to establish sustainable focal points for punk and activist organising. The images uh, here suggest some of this under-the-radar approach. The red and black anarchist flag is from Rachun Island in the Java Sea, where an event called Libertad Fest was held by a punk collective in an attempt to get beyond the interference of the police. In the gig poster at the bottom, the address is not given. You have to ask a, ask a punk and be in the loop to find out the relevant information. So some of this evasive strategy is voluntary, but not always. In the wake of the May Day 2018 protests and the anti-airport protests in Yogyakarta of the same year, when a police station was burned down, a local anarcho-feminist collective was forced to vacate their house, having been targeted by Yogyakarta local cops with a concerted campaign against them in their neighbourhood. Like in other groups in other cities, they have since relocated to the fringes of the city. This evasion may be viewed as a form of retreat, but there is a tactical advance here too in the benefits of long-term bases for networking, activism and politicisation. Strategies of evasion and confrontation should not be seen as mutually exclusive either. Stable or safe spaces that can evade repression continue to nourish the wider countercultural networks and these networks underpin instances of confrontational resistance and long-term struggle against neoliberal authoritarianism. So thank you very much for your attention. I look forward to your questions and comments and uh, you can see here some of the references that I've used in the presentation. Thank you very much. Okay, so we're going to move straight on to the next presentation, is that correct? Yep. Yep. I'll see you uh, next presentation. Thank you, Sanjay. To say thank you. Linda. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. First of all, I would like to say thank you so much to Dr. Gabriel Fakal, Patru Esrelita, Professor Michel Ford, and the whole Alto for the opportunity. And especially thank you to everyone for being here. I'm Radhi Parasidi. Today I'm going to talk about cyber troops or more commonly known as political buzzers in Indonesia. I will take a slightly different twist. I will discuss them not merely as paid propagandists, but as playing actors in moral economy and how it relates to subversion of political participation in Indonesia. 
Okay, I'm sharing my screen now. I hope the slide finds you well because this is my first time doing this. Before we get to the topic, I would like to briefly discuss what is play. I promise I will be brief here. What do we think when we think about play? Typically, we think of activities like playing football, playing war games, or cats fighting against each other, play fighting. But play, according to Bateson, is more than that. So I'd like to define play here as a frame setting or context market that delimits players into a psychological frame, a special and temporal bounding that sets the player into an interactive message. So play puts us in a subjective mood, and this action in which we engage or the players engage do not denote what actions for which they stand would denote. Or in other words, the actions are not real, but it is made to feel real. Like for example, when children are playing war games and they hit each other, they don't really mean it. They don't really mean to hit and wound each other. They're just playing. So play puts us into an as if word, a word that is imagined, but felt as if it is real. For the purpose of this paper, it is also important to differentiate between play and games. Games are a set of rules. Game is a rule governed action. It's predictable, there's a clear idea of the stakes, and there's a clear idea of what players have to do to win the game. It's very different from play, where play is more imp improvisational, there's a creative energy within it, there's a freedom that's done for its own sake, and one could be playing around without adhering to the rules. When one is playing a game, the play element is its unpredictability, not the rules in the game itself. Where one is not simply enacting rules, but also applying, applying skills, hacking through the way, expecting the unexpected, and embracing uncertainty. We will return to this point later, but it's important to keep in mind. So I'll just mention this briefly. There's a growing amount of literature working on the playful character of civic or political engagement. But what about the actors themselves, in this case, hybrid troops? So let's get into the stage, since we were talking about about theater here is the 2017 Jakarta election that has been described as Pilgub Rasa Pilpres or gubernatorial election with a taste of presidential election. So the moniker is not without reason because the candidates at the time were backed by powerful figures including the president himself but also because the election was also marked by polarization. At the time there were two controversial events that happened during the election. The first was the huge, the mass rally of Islamist mobilization that is known as 212 movement and the controversial policies done by Ahok, the incumbent candidate on Jakarta Sea Reclamation and forced eviction of Rubanpur. The election was also characterized by sectarian politics where the candidates identity is mobilized either to be vilified or to be supported. So like the preceding 2014, social media became an important site, hence the mobilization of cyber troops in this election. So the, the interesting thing from studying cyber troops is there is no agreement yet, at least, about the definition of the term. People use pretty different various terms among scholars and even among the practitioners. The term is as murky and as muddle, muddle. but to me it doesn't matter. What matters is the working definition that buzzers or cyber troops, they, they work for the propagation of a message that endorses a certain opinion about certain issue. And the distinction whether they should be paid or not is not relevant as long as they are involved in the campaign directly. So this paper focuses specifically on those with experience operating sock puppet or fake accounts. So I'll just discuss this very briefly. You can see the example here. But the important point here is the task of the fake account operators is to make a noise or making rame. Here is one example where things get interesting for fake account operators. That is when television channels ask netizens, ask the social media to give their thoughts, their opinions to be broadcasted on the television. Uh, on the screen, you can see netizen sentiments after the final debate of DKI Jakarta election. There's a sense of competition among fake account operators or cyber troops here. So they have to raise 
against that opponent raising hashtags that support their own candidate. As mentioned in previous slides, fake account operators have to make a noise and have to fight opponents, have to debate their opponents. But sometimes social media get quiet, opponents come and go, issues going up and down. So when there is no debate, it would be necessary to invent it. So what do they, what do, they do? They invent debates, they stage debates, and they pretend to be the opposing side to make things exciting. The important point here is that uh, they have to they have to put their heart onto the their opponent positions, even though they usually only caricature the opponent to look bad and to look dumb and stupid for the audience to see. But they still have to do some sort of role play, so it would be convincing that it was the opposing side who said that, not something that was made up. So it is interesting that one operator likened it to debate program in university where students have to take two different motions. But sometimes inventing debates, inventing opponents, it's not enough. So they have to invent stories. Like for this example, at the time there was so many, there were so many Indian accounts that were circulating around Facebook and Twitter at the time. And it turns out the Indian accounts are fake accounts, fake people invented by one of the operator I talked to. So to him, it made sense. It made sense for Indians, or in this case, actually Sri Lankan, to talk highly about Indonesia, about Jakarta, about Ahok, because Gojek was, there were so many outsourced Indian workers there. So logically, according to him, Indians and Sri Lankans must know Jakarta, must know Indonesia. So it's interesting that there is a creative process here, playful process that uh, the operators try to think what makes a story, what makes an interesting story for audience to know. One thing I noticed during my conversation with fake account operators or cyber troops is they describe their activities as playing, playing on online, mind the online, or playing on source mat, mind the source mat. So there is a sense that they are play tricking or deceiving others into something, into believing something that is not going into as if world delving into denoting something that which does not stand for the actual action. So in Indonesia, it's, it has similar sense of when someone says you're playing with others' feeling atau kamu mainin perasaan orang. There is some sort of tricking something, luring someone into the active words they created. So this is not to say that they don't believe the play themselves because as theories of play describe, the make-believe of play also or especially apply to themselves. So this is especially noticeable when they have to role play the opposing side. Um, they have to put their heart or menjiwai the role of the supporter of, of opposing candidate. But this putting oneself into the heart also applies to some cyber troops who do not have the conscience or idealism genuinely support the candidate. For example, one any supporter who had to support Ahok in the election. They would say, uh, kita profesional aja, or we are being professional here. So when they are doing the work, they would take it as a serious play. They would invest their heart into it. But outside the work, when they get back to home, outside the office, they would relieve themselves from the make-believe. But there's also some sense of accomplishment that they will contrast this to main di lapangan or turun ke lapangan playing on the field or going to the field as in going acting as a part of the official campaign team so there is like some some sense of hey we're we're just sitting in the in front of the computer but we can manipulate and we can the way politics goes there there is a there is a sense of they are tinkering tampering with the how politics is currently done with their own way hacking through their way improvising when asked about government reg regulating political buzzers or cyber troops, they would laugh at the questions and ask me back, how do you think the authorities will regulate us? How can they verify who is involved and how can they prove that? So what I'm getting here is that they are, there is a sense that they are playing with the questions of identity that 
between campaign team and ordinary citizen. They would always say things like, we are an unofficial campaign team. We are an unregistered campaign team and we can be free. We can do whatever you want without being restricted on what to say, how to say it, and when to say it. One operator said just three months before election that he is not worried about the time closing because he is outside the boundaries of the election law. He can still promote his candidates without having to worry about the limited time frame. As a matter of fact, not all operators are supportive of their candidates, but moral or ideological motivations seems to be prominent. As one operator said, you don't expect to get much money here. You need to have something else to motivate you. In other words, you need to have the heart and conscience to support the candidate. And in this sort of situation, in this sort of feeling, there is a sense of excitement that they gained from or they gained from debating. And the debate is not done only for the sake of debate itself, but for the fact that these debates and the whole fake account operation allowed them to be a big something bigger, bigger than themselves someone who contributed to the shift in Indonesian politics, political arena. They imagine themselves as political players, as someone who are watched by the audience and who behave like the politicians that they watch on television. The televised debate sayings and maneuvers of politicians, all the theatrical aspects, seems to have a huge impact on their perception on how politics ought to be done. And by doing their part in cyber troops, they feel like they are becoming one of them. So they feel like they are gaining political agency. The cyber troops sense of spectacle is embedded within the Indonesian democracy because as we motorized parade or Pawai motor is a common occurrence in election. As you can see here, motorized parade during Jakarta election too. So there, there is a sense of carnivalex elements performance elements election in Indonesia. Such motorized parade is usually regulated by commission and election, structured in formal politics, while cyber troops are not. Cyber troops are really playing their identity as unregistered team to freely navigate the polarized political climate in Jakarta election. Some operators like Fajar was afraid of expressing his political opinion in public in fear of ruining his relationship with his friends and colleagues. He used his fake accounts to express his opinions and at the same time support his candidate. The cyber troops gave him opportunity to express what he thought and play with the ideas, exercise like a student exercising their motion for debate and attempt to learn something new. But like Graeber said here on the screen, play can also be destructive. Does this mean cyber troops play will bring change to Indonesian democracy? Unfortunately, cyber troops pose more problem than it offers solution. We need to remember cyber troops connection to volunteerism that it emerged in 2012 with the rise of political volunteerism featuring Jokowi and Ahok through the organization called JASMEF. Volunteerism, which is which holds the idea that uh, there is a good person that we need to bring into the politics, this honest person, and bring changes to, to the corrupted establishment. So cyber groups live with this sort of personality-driven politics, which ignores structural problems in Indonesian politics and relies on individual qualities of a good leader, a supposedly good leader. The other problem is that in the end, cyber troops ultimate goal is to defend their clients or their candidate because uh, it has ties to political campaign industry. Although the cyber troops themselves see their work as a moral calling as a calling, as a moral economy, a mercenary with a cause, so to speak. Industry-wise, cyber troops is still entrenched in the marketization of politics 
It is interesting that this economic character can also be seen to certain extent among the cyber troops themselves. As early as 2016, talked to one of the fake account operators I mentioned here. He aspired to be a coordinator, someone in the high rank. He hoped to be noticed by his coordinator. and be introduced to the closer circle of political elites or political entrepreneurs. This economic motive or character in the end turned cyber troops vulnerable in supporting authoritarian practice because they need to secure resources that can only come from select political actors in which the actors might promote politics that might not be beneficial to the wider public or as Fossati calls it, authoritarian innovations. Today, we can see how prevalent cyber troops operation ordered by state actors in 2021. To conclude, cyber troops operation is a politics of escape. It provides refuge for people who wanted to participate in political discussion in a polarized society. It allows a playful engagement. However, due to its nature, cyber troops is subservient to the interest of the capital. At the same time, it's playful, it's disruptive. Attitude also eclipses other forms of civic engagement and it can hurt democracy in the long run. As you can see in the past year, in 2020, there were so many cyber attacks to activists, to civil society elements. And partly it was done by cyber troops who participate in the interest of Jokowi administration. So that would be all. Thank you very much for staying with me here. I'm looking forward to feedback and the discussion we will be having. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, another really interesting presentation. We'll move straight on now to Talpan, shall we? And in the meantime, everyone, could you keep your questions coming? I've got plenty for Jim at the moment, but we could have some more for Pradipa on his paper. So while you're waiting for the next one, get those questions coming through the chat. All right. I will, I will play the video. For City, Indonesia. I am Tofan from Andalas University, Indonesia, and a PhD candidate at Nagoya University, Japan. I am honored today to join this conference. I would like to make a presentation on my paper with the title Civil Society and Oligarchic Power, a case study of broadcast media reform in post Suharto, Indonesia. This presentation will touch first the background of the study, second the methodology, third finding and discussion, and finally fourth will be the conclusion. So let's get started from the background of the study. The background of the study. Historically, the broadcast media were controlled and developed by the Suharto regime and his family and cronies and served as the agent of state of the new order, particularly in the 1990s and 1990s. And then in post reformacy after the resignation of Suharto in 1998, media sociologically changed and transformed into more freely and market-driven media along with reform promising regulation such as the fresh law of 1999 and the broadcasting law of 2002 and the law of ITE or information and electronic transaction of 2008. Those are regulations made democratically to promote 
democratization in the media sector after the reformation. However, three decades after the reformacy, oligarchic elites have been fully reconsolidating and reorganizing their power to hijack the democratization process including regulation and utilize the commercial media for their electoral interests. So, broadly speaking, one of important article of the broadcasting law of 2002 is to establish KPA, KPI or Indonesian Broadcasting Commission to safeguard and protect the public good from increasingly market-oriented media and elite interests which tend to contradict the broadcasting law and public good. Indeed, KPI had already tried to play its role under civil society support to control private commercial media. However, those private commercial media had pulled back by utilizing the political alliance with media owners and added power from political parties to weaken KPI role and influence its selection process. KPI finally uh, tends to look give up and natural in uh, the media sector. So therefore, civil society in the sector tried to not only criticize its power and commercial media, but also to question uh, KPI, KPI role to implement the broadcasting law of 2002 and promote public oriented media in Indonesia. In short, civil society along with digital media are there are race to challenge the oligarchic power behind the commercial media and KPIs. So the methodology in this research utilized a case study for broadcast media reform to demonstrate fluctuation in the relationship between civil society, media magnates, and oligarchic political parties. I collected data to pre-work, interview with civil society in the media sector, media practitioners and journalists, KPI commissioners and academics, along with documentation for media, for media and internet-based media during two decades. So, I like to come up with finding and discussion. I will briefly touch three issues. The first one, edit power and focus media relation. The second one, KPI's role. And the last one is about civil society's uh, activisms. The first one is about elite power and progress media relation. So the huge interest of the elites in the business and politics after the reformacy influence the process of democratization. One big example of this political process is the policy failure of implementing the broadcasting law of 2002 resulted from oligarchy's attacks. In other words, oligarchic elites after the reformacy under decentralization and electoral politics they organized 
in political parties and business networks, especially in the business and extracted business, to build their power and political network to win in the electoral democracy. Thus, those parties, elites, and businessmen protected their political and media resources and supported with one another during two decades after the reformation. So as a result, KVI or Indonesian Protestant Commission is even harder to control the oligarchic elites and businessmen behind the media sector. In fact, most private commercial media were owned by politicians and that is why they were under elite control, especially in the electoral process. TP1 belongs to Abu Rizal Bakri, therefore tend to support Golkar Party and their coalition. Metro TV belonged to Surya Palos, therefore partly supported the Nasdaq uh, party and their coalition. Indeed, the political realms and elite's mindset This phenomena is considered trivial, but in the broadcasting media sector, this is a systemic violation of the main principle of broadcasting law, uh, public good, and democratization, and against democratization. So let's come to KPI's role in this us uh, in this broadcast media reform. KPI or Indonesian Broadcasting Commission is the mandate of the broadcasting law of 2002 which regulates the broadcast media sector. KPI should ideally be independent and free for political and business interests in regulating the media. Therefore, its member must be selected fairly and supported to play this role independently. Mostly, its member often came from civil organization or academics. However, the problem lies in the fact that election process is very little built kindly listing. In fact, invisible lobbies accuse in the process of becoming a member of KPI to be commissioners. It is certain that there will be organizational and personal lobbying to internal political parties and organization because they are chosen by uh, DPR uh, or Indonesian parliament that come from uh, political parties. So in fact, elites and political parties are part of the political and business network of media owners. In the DPR or Indonesian parliament, the elected commissioners in fact are people who can be managed by the elite, political parties and media owners. They are not fully professional. Let's come to civil society activism and role. Civil society oversees the implementation of the broadcasting law of 2002 and the performance of the KPI. During two decades after the reformacy, the broadcasting law of 2002 is still considered weak in promoting full media democratization in the broadcasting sector and in responding to new structure and circumstances of digital media era today. There are a couple of criticism during two decades. First, criticism on the consistency of 
broadcasting media democratization to give licensing in the hands of KPI to push private commercial media on implementing the media regulation and the implementation of network broadcasting system in which the media should build infrastructure technology at the local level. A second criticism in protecting KBI and the media from the elite interest in the electoral moment and how to respond to digital platforms today. Thus, civil society weakened by uncertain broadcast reform, KBI and the elite have been very slow to respond to the issue of regulatory repression. Civil society is tired of waiting for the elite and cafe not to take it uh, seriously. At the same time, civil society in this sector is difficult to grow and organize by the public and civil society because this issue is too small and a bit sectoral. Also, the consistency of civil society in this sector is heavily influenced by journal which had which have recently been decreasing even some communities and media advocacy dies and are not feasible anymore in public space in protected uncertain situation and condition today civil society leave the issue of uh, legal repression and uh, KVI's ideal role and instead of seizing the time of internet today and developing digital literacy media to challenge the oligarchy tendency today. For example, the online media RemoTV.com which promoted critical media literacy for young people. So in this context, the broadcast reform movement is increasingly unclear and lost its direction and tend to allow the elite to politicize the private media for their electoral political, inter political interest today. Finally, we come to the conclusion part. So, I have three conclusions. The first one, it seems to me the political elites are too domineering the broadcast media and contributed to the policy failure of the broadcasting law of 2002 during two decades after the reforms and they hijack the media in the electoral politics during two decades after the reforms. So this is the very sad story of broadcast media in Indonesia. And the second conclusion KPI as the regulatory body or uh, Indonesian Broadcasting Commission does not play its role optimally in uh, regulating and managing media sectors. So CAFE is full of limitation because uh, being controlled by fantastically the party edits. And the last one, civil society is getting weaker in supporting democratization and public good in the broadcasting sector during two decades after 
the reformasi thank you for joining my presentation until the next time Thanks for that presentation. And we'll now move to the final presentation. Uh, keep the questions coming. I'll make a note of them and then I'll go through a few rounds after we've listened to this paper. The reality uh, in the last five years, 2015 to 2020, actually shows the tax on campuses uh, and academics have continued and increased. Uh, the tax on academics, member of the university and its academic uh, activities are left without uh, accountability. And hence, the situation actually is parallel uh, to the context of declining democracy and the rise of uh, authoritarian politics in Indonesia. As mentioned by uh, Fedi Al Hadis in 2017 uh, at Aspinal, and also Evo Burton in 2018, and also Thomas Power in 2018. Uh, my uh, articles argues that in an anti science power structure, science is only a political accessory. Meanwhile, intellectuals and uh, even formal pro democratic activists in the political bureaucracy maneuver to defend the power by denying science. And hence, I uh, put the title of my presentation is The Return of uh, Indonesia's Authoritarian Politics and Its Impact to Academic Freedom. Uh, my article has three, three questions. The first one is, how does authoritarianism in Indonesia currently affect the worsening situation of protecting academic freedom and the production of scientific uh, knowledge? And second, why can the regime easily take advantage of intellectuals to be involved in supporting anti-science uh, policies so that in the context of overcoming the corona pandemic policies that endanger the public interest are created. And the third one, why the campus submits easily to regime rules that make the bastion of academic uh, freedom is so fragile. On the basis of these three uh, questions, uh, I also uh, consider in the midst of these pressures and threats to academic freedom, what have been and are being strived to promote policy change and to what extent civil society strategies could affect to the changing situation. And this article applies an interdisciplinary approach in order to explain the political trend of academic freedom policies in Indonesia. Uh, amidst the intensifying attack civil liberties, which today is not only happening in Indonesia, but uh, also it is a global phenomenon. And re responding to the first question, how does authoritarianism in Indonesia currently affect uh, the worsening situations of protecting academic freedom and product, pro producing the scientific uh, knowledge? Of course, it is related to uh, or parallel to democratic uh, regressions or the turn to authoritarianism or repressive pluralism as mentioned by Greg Philly. And uh, I myself consider that uh, for the last uh, five years, six years, uh, especially after uh, 50 years, after six, 1965, uh, the wave of uh, attacks on campuses uh, related to the uh, authoritarian legacies of new order, especially uh, by stigmatization of uh, communism. And it was really the largest cases in Indonesia and uh, quite effectively silencing the critics and also uh, 
uh, banning the discussions uh, and also sending uh, the students to the jail because of uh, abusive uh, uh, pressure uh, in order to uh, stop or end the strikes. And therefore, unsurprisingly, the situation is actually parallel to the uh, regulation of uh, freedom of expression itself. And why can the regime easily uh, take advantage of intellectuals to be involved in supporting anti-science policies? So that in that context of performing, especially during uh, corona pandemic, uh, the policies endanger public interest. Uh, and hence, I have three arguments. The first one is dominant narrative in a fragmented uh, civil society movement, especially um, looking at the issue of uh, electoral democracy during 2014 and 2019, and it was really uh, uh, dif uh, dividing into uh, numbers of groups, at least from uh, the pattern of uh, presidential uh, elections, uh, Jokowi and Prabowo as, uh, uh, as uh, the dominant or the key uh, actors and uh, followed by many uh, scientists and also civil society groups. And my second argument is related to no alternative uh, strong social movement in this country. A little chance to develop alternative uh, and especially mostly more or orchestrated, orchestrated by uh, the beauty of uh, democratic regime since formalism in uh, democracy also uh, produce the belief uh, in most uh, civil society groups that they could access the result of democracy but unfortunately uh, this really limiting the free of expressions and also shrinking civic space and uh, my third argument is because of uh, silencing criticism. Uh, no academic freedom uh, climate and also quite uh, effective uh, in disciplining uh, academias and also students. And this is also part of shrinking civic space in this country. And uh, I would like to uh, discuss also the last uh, question in my uh, arguments why the campus submits easily to rigid rules that make bastion of academic freedom is so fragile. First, indeed, uh, no academic freedom tradition in this country. Uh, it's, it's, it's too much politicized uh, when uh, uh, the students dis disagree with the, the, the lecturers or uh, university management. And even among academia itself, lecturers could not criticize their management. Otherwise, they will get uh, criminalizations or suing from uh, a private lawsuit and other uh, uh, really uh, the way to uh, discipline academia. And second one, of course, uh, reflecting what what is happening in Indonesia's campuses because it's also reflecting social structure uh, feudalism for instance or formalism or nominalism in uh, in subverting element of freedom so no critical uh, exchange uh, or debates uh, in order to uh, produce uh, scientific knowledge and the third one of course all of them actually uh, I'm still uh, confidence looking at this as part of uh, authoritarian leg legacies in disciplining in disciplining uh, science therefore in order to strengthen the civil society especially in academic uh, freedom issues uh, and why we have to deal with these uh, attacks and hence uh, through its initiative in 2017 especially in december 6 to 7 december uh, in surabaya all victims and also civil society organizations including students and lecturer researchers from various universities uh, uh, have met and also discussed uh, in order to develop uh, uh, principles or we call it as uh, surabaya principles on academic freedom and interestingly 
such principles uh, got attention from the regional uh, academia, especially in Southeast Asia, endorsed by uh, Southeast Asian Human Rights Studies Network, uh, and it was endorsed in uh, Kota Kinabalu, Malaysia, 25th April 2018. And then followed by uh, greater concern from academias, then we established uh, KIKA, Indonesian Caucus for Academic Freedom. Uh, this is uh, a national and individual based alliance for strengthening academic freedom in the country, having annual uh, conference and meeting uh, in order to defend uh, rights of academia. And we also provide legal advice before the court and submitting legal opinion or amicus curiae if there is uh, academia was uh, sued by uh, the court. And uh, by collaborating with the Indonesian National Human Rights Commissions, uh, the Surabaya principles has been adopted uh, as important part of uh, freedoms uh, or fundamental rights into uh, National Human Rights Commission uh, SNP. Um, it it's, uh, consists of norms and regulation standard for freedom of opinion and expressions. And interestingly, just a few months ago, uh, such uh, standard actually was uh, recognized uh, and also agreed by the commissioners and become uh, new rules uh, that can impose or that can uh, be uh, strengthening the policies at the university level as well as at the uh, bureaucracy level and, uh, and also for law enforcers uh, not to easily criminalize uh, uh, academia. And last one, we also develop uh, collaborative work, actively participating in solidarity, uh, especially to promote uh, academic freedom in uh, Southeast Asia. So that's my points for uh, this conference. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, so we've heard from all our four speakers um, and it's been a really interesting range of papers. We've got some questions through first. So I'll start with one question for each of the speakers. Um, we've got time for you to give a solid answer, but please do be aware of other people's need to answer their questions. So no extra papers, just some good solid answers. Um, and I'll just start with one for each speaker. And please, if you've got questions for the speakers, continue to put them in the chat function and I'll add them as we have time. We've got about 15 minutes. Um, so Jim, just to start with you, um, you've got a number of questions in the pipeline, but the one I want to start with is one from Eka, who wants to know what kind of revolution the anarchists want. Thanks, Michelle. And thanks for all the people who asked questions. Hopefully, <clears throat> If I answer Eka's question, maybe I can kind of touch on the other two there as well, because I think they'll I'm overlap sorry, a little bit. Um, Jim, just focus on that question. Give us a good, sharp answer to that one, and I'll come back to you when we have time. Oh, maybe you misunderstood me there. I'll, yeah, OK. So um, I think revolution is a word that is loaded with uh, dogma and ideology. So certain ideologies on the left have a very particular vision of revolution. And I think that's particularly dominated by a Marxist Leninist version of revolution. So anarchism is a leftist movement. Uh, it does have overlaps with socialism in terms of its history and in terms of its objectives and methods. But anarchism is not laden down by dogma or ideology in the same way that's Marxism or other ideologies are. So revolution for anarchists is something that we can enact in the here and now. Um, so to look at syndicalists, for example, their idea is to build the new world in the shell of the old. So what we do now will be the basis of a future society. How we organize now is the basis of a future society. So it's if you look at the types of activism that anarchists are involved with, opposing neoliberalism and its environmental destructions, 
working with urban poor and defending uh, kampung communities and so on, that is the basis of revolution. So it's not necessarily a specific moment or a specific set of goals that you want to uh, achieve in a certain time frame. It, the, the activism that anarchists engage in is the revolution, and that's what distinguishes it from other forms of leftism. It's a, it's a praxis-based um, activism. Thanks Hopefully very that much, Hopefully that answers yeah, all three. Was, well, no, I'm going to push you a bit harder on some of the other questions, but we'll come back to that later. Um, with one for Pradipa next, Zach wants to know how your participants studied, or sorry, view, how the participants in your study viewed democracy? Thank you, Professor Ford. So I guess this is a question from uh, Zach, right? So this is a question, interesting question that can be pursued further. So from my field work, uh, they see democracy as a, mostly a tool to bring a good person to bring change from within. So it was a different time. I guess it's a pol very polarizing time. So the each buzzers or each cyber troops believe that they are bringing the right person, whether it's Ahok or Anis, to bring change uh, from the within of uh, electoral system from the within of the government so it's very electoral minded uh, and one of them is aff affiliated to tarbiah uh, or the wing of pks and there's also a hme person a student activist so with with ties to electoral politics so they only see that they, they also spe skeptical about social movement they think uh, they the social movements and demonstrations can, cannot get far in their minds. Uh, social movement equates demonstrations, and they think that social media can have more uh, pressing pressing eff effect from from how the media will report social media uh, events as being viral. So maybe there's a factor of uh, news reporting too. So they think social media is more effective because they they think it has the image of being purely from netizen from citizens so it's it's kind of contrast from pak jim's uh, anarchist so they think the the basis for democracy is electoral politics mm. okay so they're not so much interested in democracy as using the formal democratic structure electoral structure to get whoever they're supporting in um Telfan, i have a question for you um i think there were some nice parallels between your paper and pradipa's paper and I'm interested if you could talk a bit more about the role of digital media activism. You mentioned this, but you didn't go into much detail. And I was wondering if you could tell us a bit more about the tactics that the people you referred to there, so the opponents of the media, of the, the big capital M media, what tactics did they use on social media? Are you there, Telfan? Okay, thank you uh, very much. Share uh, the Okay, uh, actually, my research uh, more focus on uh, the the failure of reform policy after two decades of uh, reformation, and I try to uh, put civil society activism here is uh, like uh, a group to counter uh, undemocratic tendencies from, from elites. Uh, uh, in, in, let's say, in, in hijacking uh, reform policy uh, in broadcast uh, media. And then uh, actually, Based on my uh, latest uh, interview with uh, the ex of uh, the chief of Rimo TV, uh, and then uh, he told me that actually uh, uh, digital activism uh, among uh, students. They, they 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 tend to criticize uh, uh, elites and of course produce uh, a critic also uh, on uh, broadcast policy but uh, let's say uh, civil society uh, among young 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 uh, 
activists uh, tend to, uh, let's say, pessimistic on uh, broadcast media reform. So that's why they try to uh, to ignore the the big issue of broadcast media policy and then try to produce uh, uh, critical media literacy through their media. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, I might stop okay. you there. Um, as your study progresses, it would be very interesting to see if you um, have an opportunity to actually speak to some of those digital activists and see what they say as opposed to what the media barons say about their role. But um, I know you're still in progress. Lambang, I've got a question for you, um, seeing no one else did. It sounds like you've already done a lot through um, sort of mobilising activists and mobilising other allies in Indonesia, institutional and otherwise, and also beyond Indonesia. But I guess my question is, how do you grow the community of academics who are prepared to take the risks that are necessary to actually achieve academic freedom? Sorry, uh, I, I, uh, that's an, a noise here. Uh, could you okay. repeat the question? Sure. I mean, you've obviously already done a lot, um, mobilising resources in Indonesia and beyond, but it strikes me that to actually achieve academic freedom, you need to get a lot more academics on board. So my question is, how do you try to get academics, convince them to take the risks that are necessary to actually establish academic freedom in Indonesia? Thank you, Bumi, sir. I got the point then. Uh, yes, it's, it's, of course, it is an easy task yeah, for uh, academias to be uh, defending themselves, uh, especially trying to make a protest uh, regarding the uh, campus autonomy or uh, making uh, uh, critics for uh, against the the, the 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 government for instance uh, it's 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 common and uh, since we have no academic uh, freedom tradition uh, however uh, we start by uh, mapping the problems and uh, certainly we have no uh, legal basis for protecting uh, academia and hence, we started by uh, drafting uh, we call as a doctrine, yeah? uh, Surabaya Principles on Academic Freedom, and we use this uh, in order to defend ourselves uh, uh, before the court, uh, making a policies, negotiating with the policy uh, makers, and many others. And secondly, so can I, but can I just ask a question there? And I mean, yeah. obviously, from my background, this is an obvious question. Maybe not from other people's. Is there a place for unionization of academics as a means for achieving academic yes. freedom? Yes, uh, the next point would be uh, organizing uh, academia into an organization, especially uh, then. Then Kika is uh, sort of like uh, uh, our uh, our uh, new organization, new established organizations. Just few years, few years ago, and concerning uh, uh, defending academic freedom, and from the Kika, uh, actually the Kika facilitate uh, union facilitate uh, strategy in order to promote and encourage them uh, hand in hand in protecting academia students. Uh, from uh, any threats uh, happen to our society, especially in campus, as well as in the uh, criticism against the government in the street or in many places. So that's, we, we, we just started uh, for defending uh, ourselves. And uh, there have been many uh, uh, success stories uh, for, uh, for this and even uh, getting more attention from academia. Uh, uh, in, in the coming weeks will be uh, Dewan Guru Besar. It's like uh, professors uh, council would like to know what is the Kika uh, did and they would like to learn uh, how to strengthen this in order to uh, promote academic freedom in the campus. So this is uh, just initial step yeah, in order to build something uh, meaningful uh, process for uh, protecting ourselves. Okay, hopefully this session's been a bit of a forum to get you a few more recruits. Yes. Um, so, Jim, I do want to come back to you. Um, you touched on the themes of the other questions, but I wanted to push you a bit more on Retina's question 
about the view of the state and how you understood the state and how that meshed or not with the people that she met who claimed to be anarcho-syndicalists. Yeah, thanks, Michelle. And thanks, Retina. I thought that was uh, a really interesting question because it gets at some of the kind of uh, key distinctions of the anarchist critique and uh, and the difficulties of uh, of making that a reality in a, in a world that is so dominated by statist thinking and, and indeed state repression. Um, so anarcho-syndicalism is, is interesting in itself. I mean, Michelle, you were just talking about the importance of, of unions. Um, syndicalism is a union-based form of uh, uh, anarchist activism that can be trade unions, unemployed unions, community unions and so on. And the idea, like I said, with the IWW phrase is to to build the new world in the shell of the old. So in terms of, I think, um, activism on, on, on behalf of, not on behalf of, with, participating with the urban poor and with workers is to create that, that basis of action. So Herlan Bangs just talked about the difficulty of not having a legal basis for protecting academic freedom. The same is true for the uh, protection of uh, people living in kampungs or other urban poor or other workers. Um, it's a real big help when you have a legal basis to organise from. And in countries where there is a legal basis for organising, those are usually won through militant activism, through uh, strike action, through things that were getting towards revolutionary activism. And, and these rights were given a, a, in, 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 in a kind of a conflict situation with, with the state and with capital. So that's, that's how syndicalists think about things like um, policy advocacy and lobbying. Okay, it's a big compromise to ask the state to improve your conditions when your basic critique is anti-statist. It, it looks hypocritical, right? But the, the idea is that this is a, a, a compromise or a pragmatic approach that will build a legal basis from where you can improve your situation further. Um, you might call it a, a gradualist approach. And there are lots of anarchists who disagree with that fundamentally. But um, I mean, I, I, I'm a, a union organizer myself here with a, with a mainstream class compromise union, as, as some anarchists call it. And it's always, it's always um, a contradiction. But it, because anarchism isn't weighed down by a strict dogma or a set of party rules, you can be pragmatic and you've got to be conscious of where the hypocrisies and contradictions are and hopefully navigate your way through them. But um, there's usually a culture of resistance um, where the, these contradictions are highlighted and how you can push things back towards the, the, the revolutionary goal instead of becoming merely reformist. Um, but it's a really interesting question. Thanks, Retina, and thanks for raising it, Michelle. Okay, thanks very much. Um, our time is over. Can I first thank Widja and Elsitha and everyone who's helped with this session, but of course to our presenters and to the people who pose questions. It's been great to see so many people online. Um, and I'm going to take the opportunity to say I hope I also see you all at a Sydney Southeast Asia event sometime soon. And if you don't know what the Sydney Southeast Asia is, Centre is, look a bit, look it up, and um, maybe join. Um, enjoy the rest of the conference. Thanks again for four really thought-provoking papers and great answers to the questions. And enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks, Michelle. Thank you, uh, Professor Thank Michelle you. Hort. Um, Thank you, Michelle. Wonderful. Yeah, this, uh, yeah, thank you uh, everyone for staying with us. Um, uh, just want to make sure that, um, uh, first of all, for this panel, on behalf of uh, LPTKS as well as uh, um, Government Science Department at Bonogoro University, I would like to thank everyone uh, for joining this uh, panel, panel for, for A, yeah? and we will have another panel, uh, panel for B, uh, just in 28 minutes from now, so uh, less than half an hour, yeah. Um, and the Zoom link will be the same with this one. Um, uh, as for now, um, feel free if you have, um, um, if you want to leave or you want to stay here, um, but uh, turn off your video or you have something to ask uh, to the committee, it's also all right. Uh, do you want do you have some do you have something to announce, uh, Gabriel? No. Okay. Uh, so I think um, 
We will uh, nothing to, see nothing to announce. I was just thinking that uh, I feel that this discussion could have uh, last uh, the, the double time because it was very uh, interesting and uh, what is the organization of the conference? It's quite short, one hour and a half. But uh, obviously, we we could stay here for for one hour and to talk about the four papers. I think that there is a, a lot to to talk about, but. Um, Maybe with Jay, we'll talk further about the summer school again. Yes, so okay. It will be yeah, yeah, and we have uh, also, develop. thank you. Thank you, Gabriel. Uh, I would like to introduce you to my, uh, this is uh, uh, Dr. Dugu Yuono, yeah, the vice, um, vice dean of uh, faculty of social and political science. Uh, Hi, Gabriel. Uh, nice to meet you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, and also Prof. Didi Rabini, but perhaps is uh, busy. Um, uh, yes, uh, I would like to announce, uh, to draw your attention, everyone, to uh, our upcoming program uh, in which uh, Gabriel uh, will be uh, will be in it, will be participating uh, in it as well. This is the summer course, yeah? Uh, this is the collaboration between um, Ponogoro University and LPGS, as well as uh, Altersi, Kase, SafeNet, and also Chiseyas Kyoto University. And this uh, summer course will be held from 22 August uh, to September 4, 2021. And uh, the, the topic would be social media activism and uh, digital resilience uh, and resistance to democratic regression in Indonesia. And we will use uh, the two weeks to uh, bring together all scholars, students from uh, Southeast Asian countries uh, to discuss and reflect uh, about the current states of uh, democracy in Indonesia, as well as uh, the, the digital politics uh, as uh, integral part of it. Um, the underlying assumption uh, um, behind it is that, you know, uh, today we face a lot of issues uh, that cannot be faced by uh, one country only, uh, such as, you know, the pandemic, climate change, democratic re regression. Then uh, we think that those are the issues that, that need uh, collaboration yeah, between uh, countries yeah, to, to face them together effectively. And uh, this uh, forum uh, hopefully will be the, the, the place yeah, for, for reflecting uh, about it. Um, so please feel free to uh, contact here, the uh, contact person, Pak um, Gulam. Yeah? Uh, and you can also uh, visit our website, uh, Summer Course, the uh, Ponogoro University uh, Government uh, Science Program. Uh, perhaps that would be uh, a short uh, announcement. Yeah? And we also have another forum uh, before that, uh, which is the School of Democracy, Democracy School of LPTKS, in which uh, uh, in this uh, we bring together uh, all um, around 100 uh, scholars uh, all around the world to reflect about the current state of Indonesian democracy. Uh, and we invite them to write uh, together with us. Um, and we will publish the book. Um, uh, um, the plan is to release it uh, during our first day in 19 August. Uh, so uh, this uh, School of Democracy uh, will be uh, the forum to launch the book as well as to bring uh, together uh, the scholars and, uh, 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 and the participants will be um, the elements uh, the, that we consider as important to support democracy in Indonesia, such as uh, politicians, um, journalists, academic, religious leaders, and civil society activists. Um, uh, so I think that will be it. I hope my sound is clear enough because in the background, my kid is arguing with her mom about, about uh, she persuade her mom to watch uh, YouTube longer. <laughs> uh, do, you, do, you want, do you have something, anything to add, Pak Gulam, or? No, at all. Yeah. Okay. Gabriel, you, you want to add something? Nothing to nothing to add. Thank you so much, Kuja. It uh, was very clear. Your your yeah, voice yeah. and the voice of your kids also is very clear. Mas uh, Mas Iqbal, uh, 